So we begin with this question, what happens after unleavened bread? <clears throat> and Jesus, you know, essentially boot camp, if you stand way back from the trees and you look at the forest, unleavened bread is a boot camp that teaches us to be equipped and ready for the battle that we're going to face for the next what, 355 days. And, and again, that's why when I, when I saw that there in that verse, I thought, how'd they know what I was going to talk about, right? <clears throat> and so, strength I find to meet my trials here. And, and that's what God has been doing. He did it with Passover. Passover is to gain strength. And if you remember some of the scriptures maybe we had during, during Passover or before, it's Paul said to the Corinthian church, because you've been taking Passover irreverently, carelessly, not paying attention to the seriousness of Passover, many of you Corinthian church members are, uh, let's see, weak or strengthless, sick, ill, infirm, or dead, right? And, and so because they were taking, they weren't focusing in and discerning the Lord's body and getting a really good grip of what this salvation journey is all about, this process, it's all about, first of all, you focus in on how it started, right? And it started with the Son of God coming to earth and teaching us the basics of salvation and then showing us, you know, he said, and it's a nice little poetic saying, you know, a greater love has no man than he lay down his life for his friends. Well, that's great poetry. But then he did it. You know, he, the creator God of the universe, said, I love you so much and I want you in my Father's kingdom for all eternity. I am prepared to die and shed my blood so that my blood can cover your sins for the rest of your life as long as you stay faithful to Christ and the, and the salvation journey. In John 6, 57, he says, As the living Father sent me, and I live, I am down here on this planet, and I am living, not just because I eat bread and food and drink, I, I am living by the Father. Spiritually, I'm living by the Father, and that's why he was sinless. He was, he was in communication with the Father at all time. Now, um, I, I have a, a GPS that I have running pretty much at all times when I'm driving, and I only trust it like 80% of the time. And I argue with it the other 20% of the time. But, but what if you were in boot camp and you were going to be being trained to go out and be a soldier in the battle, in the war, and after boot camp is over, you go off to war, and what if they handed you a Jesus GPS, right? Now, how does the GPS, Jesus GPS works? Well, it's kind of like YouTube on your cell phone, only, and it talks to you. Right? And so you get up in the morning and you go, oh, I've got a job interview. And Jesus comes on the screen. He says, look in the mirror. You don't, you don't look so good. Uh, why don't you, you know. And then, uh, oh, hey, slow down. There's a traffic accident about to happen right up ahead of you. You slow down. Traffic accident happens. You turn. You go past it. You know? And so every day for the rest of your life, nothing happens. Now, the soldier on the soldier theme the soldier goes off to war and people are throwing grenades and shooting bullets and, and you know, Jesus is saying, uh, hey, duck real good because there's a grenade coming in or whatever, you know, how it's just fired in your direction. And, and so after four, five, six years at war, you come home and your mother is so happy and your wife is so happy and your children are so happy and they say, wow, how did you stay alive? That was some terrible battle you were in. I had my Jesus GPS, and every time I was about to die or get into trouble, he said, hey, why don't you turn left instead of right? Why don't you go over here? Why don't you do that? Why don't you? And, and essentially what, what Jesus wants to be doing, and see, <clears throat> these, these things are almost miraculous. I like these because these talk to the satellite, and the, and the cell phone talks to cell phone towers, and as soon as you go down behind the hill, the cell phone tower says goodbye. <laughs> And then, you know, you can't trust your cell phone anymore. But, but, but Jesus has a better system. Once we're baptized and we have the Holy Spirit in us, we're on the radar in heaven, and we have access, just like, okay, this thing is not reading anything, but I haven't turned it on. 
right? But with Jesus, we have access instantly, less than a second. We have access to Christ at all times because we are a babe in Christ. And, and the problem with most of us is we leave, it's like the doctors say, we tried every test and only God can save you now. It's like, well, we tried all these tests and all these things and medications and stuff, and we can't save you. So we're down to the end, the final end, and, and if, if you're going to be saved, it's going to have to be God because we don't know how to do it, right? And a lot of people leave it to the last before they ask God instead of the first, right? And, and we just need to get in the habit. And Jesus here, he was, <clears throat> he was asking the Father. He would walk down the road and he'd just look up into the sky and say, Father, I know you always listen to me. You always hear me. We're always in communication. And it's like, yeah, that was Jesus, and he was special, and we're, we're special. If we have God's Holy Spirit, if we're a babe in Christ, we're special. We have that same thing. We can communicate with Christ in an instant. So he goes on, he says, he who feeds on me will live because of me. And, and again, it's like we all know feeding with the mouth and getting calories in the body and having energy to do stuff, and we know... There are energy drinks. My daughter's going to run a 26-mile marathon later in the month, and I'm terrified, but, you know, she's old enough to know what she's doing. I hope it works out. She tells me that along the 26 miles, people have bottles of water, and they have little candy to give you a little, you know, suck on and get a little energy out of, and it's like you don't, nobody plans to start at the 26-mile mark at the, at the starting line and run the whole 26 miles with no intake, no water intake, no nothing intake, just run the way you is. Because most people aren't going to make it that way. They need input. So Jesus says, if you feed on me, you will live because of me. Right? So, and that is for, that, that means we can be growing stronger now. It means every day we keep feeding on him, we're going to be growing stronger. Isn't that what we, we want for babes? When a baby is born, don't we want them to grow, feed and drink and grow stronger and stronger. And then suddenly you've got an 18-year-old boy and he's like, Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> you say, I remember when he was just a little baby boy. <laughs> but we want him to grow. We don't want him to stay little, right? Um, so Unleavened Bread has been teaching us to feed on the Jesus thinking and to stay away from ungodly practices. In 2 Timothy 2, uh, 2, 2 22. That's a, that's a tongue twister. 2 Timothy 2, 22, tongue twister. Okay, flee useful lusts. Okay, what have we been doing during unleavened bread? We've been kind of fleeing leaven, right? Um, you, you, you try not to go into McDonald's and get a hamburger, because right? you're, you know, right? And, and somebody, if you happen to be at work and somebody brings you some of their wedding cake and says, here, have this with your morning coffee. Let's all have morning coffee and let's all eat Okay, uh, excuse me, I've got to go to the bathroom. <laughs> Boy, he's been in the bathroom a long time. What's the matter? Right? Flee youthful, youthful lusts and pursue righteousness. Don't just let righteousness settle on you like yeast settles on you, but go after it. Go get it. Righteousness, faith, love, peace with those who call on the Lord daily. Right? How, you know, do we eat one day a week or do we eat two days a week or... We're all pretty much in the habit of eating every day, right? And drinking every day. And, and so the festival, Passover, has an eating and a drinking uh, factor. Unleavened bread has an eating, special eating, special unleavened bread, which you're not going to go looking for. Half, on the 4th of July, you're not going to go, oh, I've got to have some unleavened bread. It's like it's out of mind, right? And people think you're nutty and crazy, right? We, we enjoy the fluffy bread. Right? So pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace, those who call on the Lord daily out of a pure heart. So in the Corinthian church, they were way off base. They needed some heavy hitting correction. And, and Jesus, I mean, Paul lowers the boom on them. He says in verse 17 of 1 Corinthians 11, now I'm giving instructions, right? I do not praise you. Okay, here's a letter from Paul, the great apostle. He writes it and it's the Somebody stands up in the Corinthian church and they read these words. This is Paul writing, I do not praise you since you come together not for the better, but for the worse. Okay, the better is to grow stronger spiritually. 
So Passover is to help us grow stronger spiritually. Unleavened bread is to help us grow stronger spiritually. This church wasn't. They were growing weaker. They were growing, they were more argumentative. They were more struggling with all kinds of problems. I mean, the, it's a long book, and virtually every chapter talks about a different kind of problem that the Corinthian church had, right? And in this particular case, in chapter 5, in 1 Corinthians 5, 7, he says, Therefore, purge out the old leaven that you may be a new lump, right? Since you are truly unleavened, right? And the next verse, therefore, let us keep the feast. Now, most of the sermons I've ever heard use these verses start with verse 7. Therefore, purge out the old leaven, which makes no sense unless you get the rest of the story. Because how could he say to them, they're already in the middle of unleavened bread, They've already gotten the leaven out of their houses. They've only got unleavened bread in their houses. They've come to church, and he says, purge out the old leaven. It's like, okay, is there any leaven here in this room with us? There isn't, is it? Because we've all been particular and obedient to make sure we didn't bring something leaven in here. There's no big cake sitting out there in the, in the you know, kitchen, right? Okay, if you go back to verse 5, which most sermons that I heard never did, is talking about the young man. There's a young man in their church, and he's having relationships with his father's wife, and everybody knows about it, and everybody in the church is happy about it. <laughs> it's like, whoa, were these people way off base or whatever, you know. So he's saying, you know, i gotta ch I got to correct you, I can't praise you, Purge out the old leaven. If you read the whole chapter, he says, my spirit is with you. When you all come together, get, him, get an eyeball to eyeball with him and disfellowship him. It's like we, we pick it up after, you know, at verse 7, purge out the old leaven. And we say, see, Jesus is preaching the unleavened bread festival here to the New Testament Gentiles. But he's saying the person is acting spiritually leavened in amongst you and the little leaven is leavening the whole bunch and so far it's gotten to where all of you are glorying that this young man comes to church meanwhile right and so he says i'm telling you straight kick him out of the church tell him not to come back anymore right and if you go over to second corinthians you can find where uh, he's in the local community. They still see him down at the grocery store or whatever. Now he's repentant. He realizes that learning the truth is the most important thing he can possibly be doing. And he wants to come back to church and he stopped his bad practices. And Paul says, I hear he stopped his practices and he has repent is repentant. Welcome him back into the church. And that's how the system is supposed to work. It's a corrective system. So in sunset tonight, <clears throat> right? Um, we go, do we go back to malice and, and wickedness, right? Because in verse 8 it says, Let us therefore keep the feast not with the old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness. It's, so spiritually thinking, we've been looking for fluffy bread. We've been looking for donuts. We've been looking for, you know, obvious visual leavened items, Right? And, and when we first do this, and when children are seeing us do this, they can point to a donut, leaven, a cake, leaven, you know, a slice of bread, leaven, right? So, so we're, we're beginning to learn the basics, but it's a spiritual lesson. Once we've obeyed and done the basics and we do it every year, right, we pretty much got down pat watching for the physical leaven items. Now we've got to start looking for the spiritual leaven items. And he says... Malice and wickedness are spiritual leavened items, and and you can't you don't just get rid of them for seven days. You get rid of them out of your life, right? And so it's a boot camp for seven days, pointing to keep on doing this, obey, be watching for malice and wickedness creeping in, and then he says, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity, which means unmixedness, and that's that's a good study all by itself, unmixedness and truth. So unleavened bread is a powerful, unforgettable. It's unforgettable. Now, Fourth of July is unforgettable in this country. In Australia, the what? <laughs> right? In this country, you all do fourth up really big. It's getting a little weaker as it goes by, and it's getting down to 
beer and hamburgers and a football game, I think. You know, it may be tailgating or something, but you know, <laughs> it's, it's like the, they never move the fourth. They could move it to a Monday or a Friday and then you'd have a three-day weekend, but they never move the fourth. It's always, and I, when I got, first got here, I said, why can't they move the fourth? And it's like, <laughs> we well, don't do that. You know, and, and so we've learned it's, it's an unforgettable thing and it represents, the, you know, the flag represents freedom, represents the Declaration of Independence, represents we were free from the British rule. And we and we've got this, uh, you know, government uh, of the people, by the people, and for the people is the way it started, right? <laughs> Hopefully, we're getting back there a little bit, anyhow. So um, we it's it's unforgettable boot camp. Just like when the soldier learns the basics of staying alive, he he does the six weeks or whatever the training is. And he doesn't, on the, on the next day after boot camp, he doesn't totally forget everything he just learned, right? And, and, and we totally forget looking at cakes as, ooh, evil, get, stay away, right? We, we, now we enjoy donuts and whatever, right, pizza, right? But the spiritual lesson is to carry on for 355 days where we are to not be mixing what God says to do with what the world says to do. And, and we've got two billion more, plus two billion people who are mixing a little bit of Jesus with a whole lot of worldliness, right? And, and one of the classic examples is the statistics say that the divorce rate amongst the two billion Christians on this planet is about the same as the non-Christians. What does that say? It says, in that area, Ain't no difference. It's like, and, and, and there should be a great difference, right? So God wants us to carry forward the unleavened bread lesson of don't be mixing truth with error. Now, we live in the best situation on the planet to mix truth with error, right? Turn on the TV Sunday morning. Here comes the error, right? Um, listen to the radio or the TV virtually any time. Fake news. We've got this new fake news. Wonderful. We, you know, we've got fake theology all around us. Everywhere. It's like yeast. It's falling from the sky. Right? And uh, so there's uh, so much fake teaching being mixed in with the true Jesus. And, and I used to hear earlier that, that they don't worship Jesus. Well, Jesus says they worship Jesus. He says, in vain you worship me. So they are worshipping Jesus, but they teach the commandments of men, error, worldliness, and mix it in with Jesus, and he says it's in vain, you're wasting your time. You're going to be a thousand years later in the second resurrection, and you just don't know it until you get there. So God wants us to carry it forward, the unleavened bread uh, message of be obedient, and you can teach that to your children through the unleavened bread Thing, right? Be obedient and then be looking for spiritual error and be looking for spiritual truth and embrace spiritual truth and reject spiritual error. Revelation 22, 18, it says, Jesus speaking, I testify to everyone who is the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues. <laughs> right? So don't be adding stuff to the Bible. Right? And, and people do. Uh, you know, I watched a little bit of Bill O'Reilly's Jesus thing last night, and he added stuff to the Bible, and he took away stuff, and he ruined it for me, <laughs> right? I'm going, that ain't right, that ain't right, that ain't right. It's like, there's like 2% truth. You know, yes, Jesus died on a stake, on a, on a sourish. <laughs> but, but anyhow, don't get me started. Verse 19, if anyone takes away from the words of this book of this prophecy, God will take away his part from the book of life. You won't go into the kingdom. You won't have eternal life and from the holy city and from the things that are written in this book. So don't be adding and don't be taking away, which was the message of unleavened bread until sunset tonight, right? Now, the spiritual lesson continues. It's like boot camp. You keep on doing what you learn how to stay alive in boot camp. So once we have begun with God's true ways... We have to block the temptations, the worldliness, the temptation of mixing truth with error. And sadly, since Worldwide broke up, and even before, churches of God have formed and then adopted error. 
So they've, they've got some true, true, true. They've got the Sabbath, that's true. You know, they've got the holy days, that's true. Then they've mixed in some other stuff, right? And, and here's the classic. This was only 60 years after Jesus died. In Revelation 2.20, says, Nevertheless, I have a few things against you because you allow that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, the only other prophetess in the Bible is Anna, who was praying and fasting in the temple and speaking to anybody and everybody she could meet about Jesus and the Messiah, right? But this Jezebel calls herself a prophetess to teach and seduce my servants, the church members, to commit sexual immorality and to eat things sacrificed to idols. It's like, my, oh my, this church has gone way off beam and they've mixed error in with truth and now what's, what's the result? It's almost a worthless church. So, it, you know, it happens. Uh, Paul says in 2 Timothy 4.3, the time will come. In the future, there's going to be a time when people will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, their wishes, because they have itching ears, they're not just satisfied with what Jesus teaches. They want more stuff. They will heap to themselves teachers, i.e. Jezebel, the Internet, people heap to They want something bigger and better and new truth and whatever, 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 instead of just working on the words Jesus says and trying to get stronger from the words Jesus already gave us. Verse 4, they will turn their ears away from the truth, right? And, and they will be turned aside to fables. And at first, you know, it's like that's just one verse. They turn away their ears from the truth and they are turned to fables. But at first, they had the truth and they mix in a little leaven, a little error. And what happens to the lump when you put a little leaven in the lump? What happens to the whole lump? A little leaven leavens the whole lump. And that's what happened to the church Jezebel was in. That's what happened to the other churches. It's like... Once you allow it, it gets bigger, it grows, and it eventually it goes everywhere. And, and, uh, so, and that's part of the lesson. Don't you know, keep watching for worldliness. Don't let uh, you know, untrue error get mixed in with the truth. Keep searching for more and more true, pure truth. Unleavened bread is a super powerful model of keeping good and evil separated. And how do we do that? We keep studying the Bible, looking in the Bible, saying, I need to be better at this, and I need to avoid that. And that's the daily process. John 5, 28, don't marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will come forth. <laughs> Most people don't believe what Jesus just said. Those who have done good, godliness, to the resurrection of life, entering the kingdom of God, those who have done evil, Right to the resurrection of condemnation, and you can do good and mix in evil, and you're in the condemnation. You're, you know, you know, it's got to be like unleavened bread. No leaven products for seven days. So those who faithfully do this, what God is saying, go into God's kingdom at the first resurrection. Those who add error to God's truths, creating an evil and good mixture, which a lot of people are satisfied with. You know. And, and, the, and the worst possible case is, I love Jesus, I gave my heart to Jesus, and I'm going to heaven when I die. <laughs> it's like a little bit of Jesus, huge amount of error, and I don't have to study my Bible because I have faith that that's what's going to happen. Okay, so you miss out on the first resurrection. So we, we've got to be avoiding the evil mixture of mixing evil and good so that we can go, and, and those, who, those who make the mixture... Right, and and we've you know I think we've all had we maybe have a good story to tell or two, right? <laughs> but but we've done pretty good. And at sunset tonight, we do, we don't have to do that anymore, except the spiritual thing we do have to do every more. We have to do it every day. And sadly, those who are mixing good and evil, they go into the judgment day. Resurrection.